Father, as it's true for all of this morning, we have said that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, as we look at your word, which was your word to us to say, this is my will, I want to see this happen on earth. And we see throughout the whole of the Bible how your will was done, even through us broken, fallen human beings who you love and who you want a real relationship with. We thank you for that. So Lord, as we look at your word, help us to have that impact in our lives, have that change us, have that in our own lives, your will be done through us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I know we have some people here who are not visitors for the first time today, but they're visitors for me. I've never met you yet, and I know you've been coming here for a few Sundays, and I hope to catch up with you uh, rather than the 30 seconds that I've had with one already. We've been going through the teaching of 1 Corinthians, the letter of Paul to the Corinthian church, haven't we? Yes. And we've all learnt lots from it, haven't we? Yes. So what have you remembered? <laughs> so, not doing that to you now, because I just don't want to embarrass myself. Um, we ended on 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which was, if you remember, the first slice of bread of a sandwich. Chapter 13 being the meat in the sandwich. And chapter 14 being the other slice of bread that makes up the sandwich. No, there's not tomato ketchup or mayonnaise on this sandwich. But nonetheless, it is a sandwich. And the reason being is that chapter 13 is sort of the essence of why Paul is talking about in 13 and 14, uh, sorry, 12 and 14. And he's talking about gifts and what would appear to be the Corinthian church holding gifts, spiritual gifts, gifts of the Holy Spirit in an overbloated manner. And he's almost having a go at them to sort of say, well, they're fighting over these gifts. They're sort of, oh, we'll come to that later. I don't want to go into it too much because we'll go through the history as we run along. But if you may remember the last one, one of the things I talked about was uh, when I had rheumatoid arthritis. And I used the analogy of that, of a foreign body tricking an actual part of the body that's doing good works, but then gets tricked into believing that another part of the body is actually needs to be attacked. The body being the church, and we can have an outside foreign body, call it Satan, tricking a member of the church into believing that they have to, got to attack another member of the church because that person is not doing God's work. When actually they are, but the other person doesn't realize they've been tricked. Do you remember that analogy? Yeah? And I used uh, uh, RA, uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a view of that. Not banging on about that even further, just talking about it's just one element sometimes we miss when we read these, that actually we are a body, we are connected. And I said that I believe that we've got to look out for each other. I mean, seriously look out for each other. I think God wants to do stuff in Greenford and Satan is not going to like it. And he's going to want to have a field day. And he is the master of trickery. So just bear that in mind. And then we ended that chapter with everybody's ears being blasted and hurt by that great music by Huey Lewis and the News, The Power of Love. Amen? Do you remember it now? If you've ever watched Back to the Future, forget Andy Robertson, he's never seen it in his life. The Flux Capacity, oh no, you've watched it now, haven't you? But The Power of Love, you know the music I'm talking about? It's got the best air guitar riff right in the middle of it. Okay. I'm sorry, you're not getting into heaven unless you've heard it. But to bring it into context, Paul ends in chapter 12 with, after he talks about, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? And he eventually goes, of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. Reason being, very quickly, is that the Corinthian church were using tongues, you know, unlearned language, language of tongues, those that speak in tongues that they've not, that they've not learnt. And normally most of us that speak in tongues don't actually know what we're actually saying as such. 
but they were using tongues and they were overusing it. They were almost sort of saying, oh, well, we've got this language. I'm really, really spiritual. That's the element we're getting. They were using prophecy as well and over-prophesying uh, and, and, and seemed to be going nuts for it. And they weren't recognizing that actually they've got to earnestly use the gifts that are going to build each other up. So Paul ends in 12 but now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. And that's what we're going to do, okay? Which is chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. Sorry we're not displaying it up there. The whole reason, I'll be up front, is the idea of me keep twisting and turning. I just, for obvious reasons, don't want to keep doing that. Mind you, I seem to be walking quite well a lot at the moment. But now, what I said last time was chapter 13 is well known. It's used in weddings a lot. Even if they're not people who are even believing Jesus, they will still use 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And there's nothing wrong in it. There's nothing wrong in a husband and wife striving to be loving examples of what love is and what it is not. Even when Joy and I do marriage preparation classes with uh, couples becoming newly married, we use 1 Corinthians chapter 13 just to help start discussing around what your relationship, the ideal of your relationship may well look like. And there's nothing wrong with it. But nonetheless, when we take it out of context of the rest of this passage, it loses what Paul is trying to get at. So are you ready to look at it in what Paul wants to talk about? Yes. Good. Thank you, Doug. I'm glad you're with me. So let's read verses 1 to 3 of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I could speak in all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Do you remember that the Corinthian church were so, they were just into rivalry right at the beginning of the letter. Who's going to follow Apollos? Who's going to follow Cephas? Who's following? I follow this. And there was all of that going on. Which leader you follow? They were very much into their positions and wanting height. And in their culture, it was very much about your status and who you are and who do you know. Well, that was in the Corinthian church. Hmm. Doesn't sound much different from our culture, does it, today? It's not what you know, it's who you know. And that is, whether you like it or not, that infiltrates church. And so the Corinthians were very much into their rivalry. Their, there was jealous rivalry. There was amongst the various church members. If you know, we've looked back at the church and seen how really they do have a go at each other quite well. They seem to be quite factioned and, and separated. They weren't being one body, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is about. You're one body. You're made up of different parts, but you're one together. And we said, what a fascinating church to be in. Imagine meeting on a Sunday morning there with all the infighting. But Paul is now using those first three verses to actually what he would appear to be seeing, attacking the way that they're using those particular spiritual gifts and they're being very boastful about it. They almost seem to be because he's sort of saying, well, if I could do all this but don't have love, what's the point? I'm always, when you read the in between the lines here, there's almost this sort of sense that they are trying to outdo each other. I must admit, when I put this together, uh, a song that was in my head, and I, I came home and said to Joy, oh, this song is in my head about this. And she goes, well, you're going to, if you want to sing it, you're going to have to do it well. Well, we know that's not going to happen. But I'll try and do at least one line. Anything you can do, I can do better. Do you understand the thing? So you can imagine that in church, at which point everybody in the room went, we can do that better than you just did that. But anyway, that's fine. 
But you almost got this Howard Kill moment and uh, in Annie, get your gun, and there's this whole argument. And I could all almost imagine them saying, well, I can speak tongues in better than you. No, you can't. Yes, I can. And then they're beating each other in tongues. I can prophesy bigger than you and better than you. No, you can't. Yes, I can. And you can see them then prophesying bigger in tongues, trying to prophesy better than each other, outdo each other. And then somebody said, ah, well, I can sacrifice better than you. I give more away than you can. And somebody says, yes, you can't. No, you can. Yes, I can. No, you can't. And then at that point, they sort of turn around and say, yes, I can. Watch our sacrifice. But it's all about what they're doing on the front, not what's going on underneath. Yes, if you've been damaged by my poor here singing, uh, please pray for healing later. You should see what joy has to go through. And Paul is saying, nothing wrong. The gifts are from God, but you're not doing them in love. Where is the love? There's another song, isn't there? Anyway. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Don't panic, I'm not. So he's saying speaking in tongues without love is like a clanging cymbal. There is no melody. Now, there's a very strong possibility that Paul is using a very close uh, relation to what's happening in the pagan temples in the Corinthian city. They tend to bang a shallow uh, metallic basin which when it's struck, gives out a very resounding note. But it doesn't have, uh, the, 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 the bell type thing, doesn't have any particular melody of it. And it's sort of calling people to come and all this sort of thing. And he might be using that as an imagery. Second of all, symbols back in those days are no different from the symbols that we sort of have today. There's two that go together. But Paul's using the singular, symbol, i.e. you're doing it alone. There's only one of you. So you might be speaking in tongues, but you're not melodic. There's nothing there. He said, you sound just noise. There's no love. It's not tuneful. It's not good to the ears, like my singing. But it's that sort of thing. It's like if Andy Robertson suddenly banged that cymbal in a really bad way. You'd be going like this, wouldn't you? And then Paul wants to carry on. He's saying, yeah, but if I have the gift of prophecy, if I understand all of God's secrets and plan to possess all knowledge, then fine. If I had all of those things, as if I was the most ardent prayer, I could move a mountain. And I believe I'm so connected to God and I'm prophesying over all of you individually and as a church and as a city. But I don't have love for my fellow brother or sister in Christ. Then I am hollow. I am nothing. And therefore, everything I do is nothing. And everything I do is false. And those first two gifts are the sort of gifts that are seen as the super spiritual gifts by the Corinthian church. They're the ones you want to have. Check them out at the front, speaking in tongues all the time. Check them out interpreting it. Check them out prophesying. Whoa, I want those ones. And I love the fact that he uses sacrifice. Giving all I own, maybe, my possessions to others, giving my time to others. That is just as equal as spiritual gifting as everything else. But then he says, but I could be giving it to working in a church, working for a charity, giving donations, monthly givings, sponsoring a child, giving to missionaries, all good things. But if I don't do any of this with love for the other person, then it means nothing to God. And by the way, it's really easy to be giving to somebody for, for somebody else. To give them something. If I gave something to, excuse me, Beatrice, don't panic. But if I was giving stuff sacrificially to Beatrice, yet I did not like Patrick. I do, by the way, you're all right. <laughs> if I did not love Patrick, I do, by the way, don't you, you're all right. Yeah? Then what I'm ever doing for Beatrice, as much as I may love Beatrice, which, by the way, I do. 
right? Whatever I was doing for Beatrice is irrelevant because of my lack of love for Patrick. Do you see the difference? There is not love at the heart of what we do and the things we do. Then we are nothing. God, we're not, God's primary role is love and compassion. And actually, people sometimes do things out of sacrifice, etc., to make them feel better about themselves. It's not done out of love. They may say it, but it's not done. I'm not knocking people giving things. That's great, and that's fantastic. But sometimes, maybe we need to look at our motives behind it. Is it because I feel guilty and I need to feel good about myself? I need to feel sort of almost exonerated and redeemed? I'll give something. Without love, without real love, it's like buying your way into heaven. And I can see the Corinthian church giving, especially the rich a lot. Oh, give, I must give, I must give. And every time there's a call and at the end of the letter, you'll see stuff about giving and we'll come to that in a few Sundays time. But are you giving just because it's the thing to do? To make you feel good? And I'm not talking about offerings here at church. I'm, I mean, there is that as well. But I'm talking about just generally giving of my time. You're doing it because you want to? Because you do it out of love for the other person? Out of love for God? Or do you do it because you feel guilty? Because I should. Or because I want to look good? And this is what was going on in the Corinthian church. And I would suggest always goes on through the centuries since. Love is not about what's on the front. It's about what's going on underneath. So now let's look at what love really is and is not verses four to seven love is patient and kind love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude it does not demand its own way it is not irritable it keeps no record of being wronged it does not rejoice about injustice but rejoices whenever the truth wins out love never gives up never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Amen? Amen. And that's the most famous verse or verses that we all know. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to witness the marriage of. And then we have this. And here today, it's dearly beloved, we're gathered here today to witness what love is and what love is not. When Paul starts here with love is patient and kind, he is describing God. These are active verbs, not passive. This is the problem with the English language. There's lots of problems with the English language. But this is the key one is when you're translating from the Greek into the English, there's some things that you miss as you go. And we're going to find that as we go along. But this is one of the things. These are actually active verbs. Love is patient. It is actively patient. The meaning here is to bear up under provocation without complaint. Be patient. Be forbearing. That's an active thing. Patient isn't remaining tranquil while waiting Patient is not sitting quietly in a waiting room, the doctors or dentists or whoever, for over an hour, waiting for your appointment without complaining. That's an inactive patient. Active patient is actually when you're being provoked, you actively don't react, you don't complain. It's very good to say, ah, well, I mean, we're a nation of cures in the... Like, I can't remember, it was some time ago, but somebody from another country, I remember them talking to me, gosh, you do like queuing, don't you? No, we don't like queuing, but we do know how to queue. But that's not what patience here is. That's just wait your turn. That's called being polite. 
Here, this is about um, why you're being provoked, why somebody maybe is persecuting you, having to go, doing it without complaining. Doesn't mean you're not doing something. This is the doing something. Kindness. It's doing something about it. God was and is very patient with us, isn't he? Amen. I'm very grateful he's very patient with me. He, he's very patient with us when we provoke him. Or others. But through his son Jesus, he reached out actively in kindness, in compassion and mercy so that we can be saved, so that we can have eternal life, so that he can work on us. And he did that in his um, patience and in his kindness. If God wasn't kind, we were all doomed. And kind is a, is a word today that's got a very low opinion. You've got to understand kind in God's way is pff, seriously active, seriously powerful. It's not being just nice. And we're called to do the same. But in a moment, we're going to go through the rest of this list of what love is not. And later on, Paul is going to talk about everything being temporary. All of these things are temporal. They're temporary. Bear with us. And these gifts, etc., cetera, uh, are temporary. There is, yeah, I'll come to that in a moment. And there is an end at some point to all of these things. Kindness and patience. There is a point, I'm afraid, my brothers and sisters, that as such, it does come to an end. And that's when judgment comes through the son Jesus on his second coming. That's it. It's all over at that point. There is no second chances. In Christ, there will be an internal judgment, but in everyday living today, there is sometimes punishment, is there not? It's done out of love, it's done out of kindness, and it's done hopefully after a time of being patient, but there are times that we punish. We punish our children, do we not? We don't do it hopefully to be angry or rude with them, we do it out of kindness, knowing that what they're doing is wrong and they might need correcting. Sometimes you're patient with them, you might want to talk to them gently about it first saying what you were doing wrong. Then probably about, if we're honest, about a minute later, we're probably launching at them. But the point is, is that we do these things out of loveness and kindness. We sometimes punish them, send them to the naughty step or whatever it is you do, actually truly out of love and kindness. So there are some times that you don't just allow things to ride. You have to sometimes nip it in the bud and deal with it. But you're doing it out of compassion, out of kindness. So love is patient as, and is kind, but it doesn't just let things ride. So let's look at what love is not. It's not jealous, it's not boastful, it's not proud, it's not rude, it's not demanding of its own way, it's not easily irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. Quite a nice easy list, yeah? I oh, understand all of that. Fine, not a problem. Well, as I said, the English language, as brilliant as it is, it sometimes doesn't help in some of the definitions here that actually was meant in the original language. So we're going to look at them to get the fuller flavour, okay? And I will be upfront, I'm going to be using Gordon Fee's definitions because they just were much better worded than I could even try and do. But I will be throwing some of my own stuff in there along the way. So Gordon Fee is one of the scholars. I'm going to use his definitions, but I'm also going to sort of go outside of it, but I'm not going to make a separation uh, between the two. Um, but um, just thought I'd mention that. So jealousy, envy. The meaning is it does not allow fellow believers to be in rivalry or competition, either for vaunted positions or to curry people's favour in order to gain adherence. Indeed, it seeks quite the opposite. Love seeks how best do I serve these for whom Christ died, whatever my own desires. In other words, 
What love definitely doesn't do is want to sidle up to the people that look the most important. Or it doesn't turn around telling people little things in their ears that maybe are wrong and wanting people to follow me, to back me up. Which is what was happening in the Corinthian church. They were trying to get all their little sect going in their little regions. Out of jealousy. Because somebody wanted to be the highest position in the church. Maybe they were the ones to be up the front doing all the talking. Or they wanted to be the one that controlled the money. Do you see what I mean? Love doesn't do that, does it? It's not worried about what the other person's got and not got. doesn't care. Actually rejoices for them that they have got it. Love does not boast. Now, funny enough, this was a rare word that was being used, and it literally means to behave as a braggart or be a windbag. Now you're all sitting there going, yeah, yeah, Warren, windbag, yeah? See? No. It suggested self-centred actions in which there is an inordinate desire to call attention to oneself. Hi, me, look at me. I've got something to say, so I'm going to wabble on for about an hour. That's a windbag. And it's all about me. Me, 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 me. That's boasting. It's not always about, God's done this through me, you know. Could you pray about this situation because I've got this going on? And you could repeat it time and time and time again. Now, bear, when I said that, please bear in mind, I don't want people suddenly think, oh, I better not ask for prayer for that because people might think I'm being a windbag and boastful. I'm not talking about that. But there are... Sometimes language can be used and people you can identify people by the way that they phrase something. Normally when it's my this, my that, that tends to be, they're actually really talking. It might sound really good on the surface, but it's actually what's going on underneath. They're talking about themselves and look at me. Love is not proud means puffed up, overtones of arrogance, not proud is being arrogant, there's nothing wrong in actually having some pride for other people, having an element of pride in seeing Pastor David and knowing what God's doing through him, there's nothing wrong in that, being proudful of your children, there's nothing wrong in that, being proud for your friends, there's nothing wrong in that, but this is about being proud, overly proud for yourself. Being puffed up, look how good I am. God is using me with tongues. God is using me to prophesy. I'm brilliant. We're brilliant. We're a great church. God is really, really war all over us. And Paul is fine, but that's your greatest sin, actually. Because actually, when you look back in the Bible, you're being so unholy, so ungodly, so unloving, and actually unchristian. How dare you be that arrogant about yourselves? You see the... It is not rude. Believe it or not, that doesn't just mean not swearing. Actually, the wording here really means to behave shamefully or disgracefully. Like, for instance, do you remember we were looking at the dress code of back then, how the women were trying to be? Everything was permissible, I can do anything. So the women were trying to almost dress like the men. But back then, that would have been just shame and disgrace upon the men in the church, upon uh, their partners. Do you remember that? Upon other people walking around on the streets. Just back then, it was not the thing to have done at all. It was not helpful to the kingdom of God. Or the others, the ones that have got lots, the have-nots, who were being shaming the have-nots by their behaviour at the Lord's table. Do you remember that? They were just eating and getting drunk. That's shameful. That's disgraceful. That's just being 
plain rude. Christian love cares too much for the rest of the community to behave in such unseemly ways. It's so easy to say, well, it's all about me and what I do. But it reflects badly on the Christian community if it is really disgraceful and really shameful. Now, you have to break out what is shameful and what is disgraceful. Love is not demanding of its own way. I want to do this. So I wanted to stamp my foot and then my back went, don't you dare. So that's why I went quiet then. It's not demanding of its own way. Do you remember back when it was eating food for idols and people that said, oh, I'm free to eat anything because everything is the Lord's. So we can eat all this food that's sacrificed to idols. Do you remember that in the idol temples? And Paul was saying, yes, you can, but you're damaging the, 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 the weaker mind of those that are weaker believers who think this is going to hurt them. And you're not doing any good to those who don't know Christ yet because it, you're making it look like uh, at your religion accepts everything and anything anyway. And you can demand that as much as you want, but if it's not for love, if it's not for the good of the other person, then it's you demanding your own way. It's all about you. Well, what love are you showing to others then? And love is not easily irritable. Now, I have a confession to make. Just to prove that I am perfect, I haven't got this sorted yet. Firstly, it got pointed out yesterday by some friends that I'm actually quite grumpy. True. I can have my moments. But as I was preparing this sermon, I got to this particular point and I was writing things out and preparing it. I suddenly remembered something I needed to let Joy know about very quickly, which wasn't going to wait to the time I got home. So I phoned her up. And this is all my fault and all my problem, by the way. Okay, hear me very carefully. All right with me? So I phone up to mention something, and Joy just responds back as Joy did, uh, uh, in quite loving, not understanding what I had said, and not quite picked up what I was getting at. My fault, I hadn't explained myself clearly enough. And she wasn't irritable back, she just asked a question. Well, because I was feeling a little bit rushed, I then started finding myself getting really irritable. Really quite, <clears throat> what do you mean? You're not? Yeah, that, I'm not perfect. And I found myself doing that. And then all of a sudden, you know when, so I'm on the phone and I'm suddenly looking at the sermon notes and I'm suddenly going, and then God went, look at what you're about to write about. <laughs> so at that point, I calmed straight down immediately. Joy knows none of this. this is the first she's heard it. Because <laughs> she suddenly noticed there was a change in my attitude of, I'm sorry, darling. I'm admitting this to you to prove that we're all like it. We can all have our moments. All of us have our weaknesses and they all have our bits about us. And it's normally our loved ones, the closest ones to us, that we take out most of our frustration and aggression or, or whatever's going on. Our most negative bits go out in the ones that we love the most. Be it our kids, be it our friends, be it our partners, be it whatever. But actually, I would suggest to you, the person who should be closest to her overall is the only one being in the entire universe, and that's God. Take it out on him, because guess what? He's got broad enough shoulders to deal with it. So irritable here, the meaning is to cause a state of inward arousal. To let oneself be carried away in anger. The one who loves is not easily provoked to anger by those around him or her. I love my wife. As I mentioned this in passing. But what I'm pointing out to you, you know, we're all human. The reason for that is just actually it's so easy. If you've got a constant state of irritability in you, you maybe need to look at who, who, where is your focus? Where's your love? Where are you drawing your love 
from. It's not so much output, it's more about input. If you're getting it from God, there's going to be less and less output of irritability. There's going to be less and less output of jealousy. There's going to be less and less put of anger. There's going to be less and less output of all the things that love is not. As you more and more draw it from God through Jesus, through your relationship with God. You with me? Hence why Paul says, this is the best way of all, love. It keeps no record of wrongs. So just scrap all my wrong. Don't remember what I've just said. What it really means is that a person does not contemplate evil. The person doesn't contemplate evil, does not think about evil. Either in the sense of doing an evil act or in the sense of suspecting others of evil. That's interesting, isn't it? By the way, so in the minute we think of evil, we think of things like murder, etc. Well, in God's sight, any sin effectively is evil. Maybe you want to think about getting your own back on someone. Bit of revenge. And we all said to go, no, 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 I don't hate anybody enough to get revenge. Well, let's maybe think of maybe if you're in, I don't know, sibling relationship or a relationship and you think to yourself, you know something, they did that to me this morning. I'm going to be smug and get my own back later with a bit of a wind up. Is that loving? Bit of humour maybe. But sometimes it's just like, see, I told you so. I do wonder if that's contemplating evil sometimes. That's being smug. Anyway, you think about it for a minute. But the one thing that gives me is suspecting others of evil. Somebody might have done something wrong to you at some point in your life, and every time that person comes up to you, you could think, oh yeah, go on then, now what? What are they up to next? What is it they want to get around? What are they after? Do you understand what I mean? Here, love eventually stops suspecting that at every turn. Because you never know, God might be really working in that person, really changing them. And actually, when they come up to you with something, an idea, or want to just say hello, they actually nothing malicious behind it other than, hi. But your reaction is like, what are they after? Barriers go up. Yeah? I, interesting. And there are people in our lives that they are conniving. They're always after something. They're after their own way. And there is, you do have to sometimes be very cautious. We have to be a, a wolf in sheep's clothing sometimes. We need to be as cunning as a fox, but gentle as a lamb. But we shouldn't always assume that somebody who may have done us wrong in the past is ready to do us wrong again. Love doesn't contemplate that all the time. And in the Corinthian church, I can imagine that relationships were so fractured, you just never believed anybody if they really genuinely wanted to be loving. Do you see the difference? As I said to you, you go back to that church, you think, goodness me, how did we get to Christianity 2,000 years on? Because it looked really fractured. But this is where Paul, God used Paul to bring about healing and change within it. Love does not rejoice in injustice, which means it does not gloat over others' misfortunes. Love refuses to allow war. It refuses to allow the suppression of the poor. But also love does things closer. It does not gloat over the fall of a brother or sister. Love absolutely rejects the pernicious form of rejoicing over evil, Gossiping about the misdeeds of others, it will not be gladdened when someone else falls. So it's not just about the big global injustices that we were talking about uh, earlier on, like human trafficking and things like that. It's also talking about the injustice done upon each other. If we're honest, how sometimes we want to look at someone and think, ha, I didn't like them and misfortunes come their way. Good. Love doesn't do that. What it does do 
It rejoices when the truth is out. Amen? Love never gives up, never loses faith. It is always hopeful, endures through every circumstance. Doesn't that sound far too lofty to attain? To endure through every circumstance. That's what love does. We only get that supernatural strength from God himself, who is love. I think for me here with Paul, what was going on was partially was that the Corinthians were just so fractured and so damaged that they just lost all hope almost of ever actually being one body. There was just so much infighting. And he's saying, but love never gives up. God's love for us has never and will never give up. And that's the highest form of love. And that's who we are meant to be like, yes? So much didn't give up that he sent his son Jesus to die. Remember that Paul here is talking in the context of the misuse of spiritual gifting. Verses 8 to 10. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless. But love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. This is where he starts talking about things being temporary. Love is eternal. It has to be. It's the very essence of God. It's not just part of his character. It is him. God is love. So love is eternal, but spiritual gifts are temporary. They have a finite time. They're temporal. Because they are for the here and now. To build each other up. To build up to the church. And also to be used as a witness for God to non-believers. The Corinthians saw the gift of prophecy in tongues and especially tongues as evidence that they've reached a particular spiritual closeness to God. Paul is saying, no, 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 they do not mean that at all. These gifts do not mean you have got some spiritual attainment. Because they're temporary, they will end when Christ comes. Only love is endless. Prophecy, for instance, is never fully complete. It's only ever delivered in part. You only ever known love, uh, prophecy in part. When we get a word of God or a prophecy or something God is pointing to, we only know a little bit of what God's getting at. You'll see that in all the prophecies that happen in the Old Testament. When he called Abraham, he just said, I'm going to make you a great nation and a blessing. He just pointed something. He didn't know how that was going to look and what that looked like. And then considering Abraham, he sort of shrunk it down to more and more things through the other chapters, like 15, 17 and 19. He sort of closed it down. So Abraham got more and more of a picture of what it's going to look like. But Abraham still didn't know, ultimately, he only saw in part. When we hear things from God, we only ever know in part. It's a signpost to something. And we only ever know what it looked like when we've actually reached it. And to be honest with you, we're ever going to fully reach it when Christ comes. We have prophecies here in the Church of Time. We've got one going back to 1998. We're only starting to now glimmer some of the, oh, maybe that's partly what it means. And that's what Paul is saying. He said, great, you have prophecy, but it really doesn't tell you everything. You only know in part. Only love is endless. Verses 11 to 12. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see these things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. So verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. 
Paul continues this argument that gifts are temporal and only for a time. As a child, I relied on childish understanding of things. As we grow up, we're meant to rely on mature understanding of things, yes? We've got to stop being childish in our reactions and our understanding and thought processes. We've got to put those things away. That's what we're meant to do as adults, yes? I'm not quite sure as adults we always do that though, are we? I think Paul is saying something here in a bit of code to the Corinthians that I like. You think so highly of these gifts and therefore then you think so highly of yourselves. You think you've reached a maturity in Christ because you have them. I'm telling you, these gifts are child things in God's sight. They are basic stuff. Stuff that we can understand now because like a child, we're like children compared to God. These childish things will be done away with once the complete return of Jesus has arrived and you have finally grown up and become mature. Yes? Therefore, you're acting like children at the moment. That's what I reckon he's really getting at. You're squabbling over who follows who. You speak about what tongues are best, who has the greater knowledge, who prophesies. You squabble like children and you reason like children. My, mine, 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 boo-hoo, not fair. That's really hurting, but we'll move on. But that's the point. I think he's saying to him, you're acting like kids. Grow up. And do you know that's a big insult because children were unseen and unheard, not even worth counting back then. You're acting like kids over your gifts. Grow up. These gifts are temporal. They do not mean that you have reached some great spiritual plane. These are things you need because without them, you're absolutely next to nothing. But they're temporal. Don't get excited about them. And that's the point. I, we could, oh, you could squabble over gifts within each other, but not everybody's meant to have the same gifts. It's like squabbling like kids over them. Let's not. The gift you've got given to you by your loving father is the gift that he wants you to have. And it could be more than one, but, you know, let's not squabble. Verse 12. Now, we see things imperfectly, just like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then, when Jesus returns, we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely I love this verse and this is why I could talk about the mirror what does he mean by the mirror imperfectly polished brass the Corinthians I Corinth the city was well known for making the finest mirrors but it was made out of polished brass ever looked into polished brass you can't see your reflection that clearly there'll be distortion it's not quite as good our mirrors today are much better are they not as long as you keep them clean I could talk about that. And Paul is getting at here. He says, actually, what we know about God and what we know about the future and what we know about what we think is going to happen is almost like looking at my own reflection in polished brass. I can see it. I can see it's me, but that's about it. It's distorted slightly. It's not entirely accurate reflection of myself. Eh? I could talk about that. And he's saying, when Jesus comes, you'll get the full picture then. I could point out that Paul is also using the bigger view of the Old Testament here about prophecy. He's saying, listen, in Numbers 12, 6, and the Lord said to them, now listen to what I say. If there were prophets among you, I, the Lord, will reveal myself in visions and I will speak to them in dreams. That's what's going on. That's the spiritual gifts in the church. But not with my servant Moses of all my house. He is the one I trust. I speak to him face to face clearly and not in riddles he sees the lord as he is oh i wish to be moses it will make life so much easier if i could hear god absolutely spot on clearly and knew everything yes who would all say yes please yes. unfortunately these things will happen when jesus returns 
I could talk about his giving them the bigger picture about seeing things more clearly. You're not going to see things as clearly as Moses did. But this is the bit I love about this. It's what is it? What is it I love about? Well, it's about the fact that at the end of time, I will know everything completely. At the end of time, you will know everything completely. Amen? Amen. But this is the bit I love that it just says, but now, today, God knows me completely now. He knows you completely now. Think about that for a minute. He knows everything about you, yet still loves you. He knows everything about me, yet still loves me. Think for a minute, because you're going to think about all your bad stuff. But think about all the good stuff that God's put in you. He created you, and he knows you completely now, entirely, and still says, I love you. Beckons you for a relationship. Wants you to come to know him every day, spend time with him every day. That's a mind blower for me. That's a mind rush. Is it for you? Because you're sitting there going, oh, God doesn't want to know me today. He does. He knows you completely. He knows everything about you. Beard or no beard. He knows every hair on your head. And I've got more now. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm losing them up here. But what I'm getting at is the fact that Lord knows you inside and out completely and still says, love you, want relationship, come on in. That's the power of love. It's this God who says, come on. How can you deny that when a God who knows you completely still says, I love you. I want a relationship with you. I want to be with you all of the time. I want you to be with me all of the time now, today. How do we go, whoa, breaks on. Not committing myself completely to you yet. Or you can have this bit of me so far. Yes, I've got baptized, but I still want to hide things back. And God's saying, but I know all about it anyway. I still love you. Come on. And this was Paul writing. Paul, who would consider himself the worst of sinners. Persecuted Christians, arranged their deaths, a murderer. That for me is a rush. He knows my irritability, but still loves me. He knows all your stuff and still loves you. I want you to walk out of that at the very least this morning. Verse 13, three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Now, all of a sudden, Paul's talking about love being the absolute ultimate, and then he suddenly throws in, ah, no, no, these three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. Where did faith and hope suddenly come from? Why will they last forever? He quite rightly says that love is the greatest of these. It would appear that the faith, love, and hope is more than likely, in the way it's got written originally, it's actually a familiar triad that is used in the early church preaching. What I mean by that? What what I say? God is good. And all the time. Okay, there you go. It's the same thing. Imagine a preacher going, ah, faith, hope, and love. Then probably the church would go. No, they wouldn't say that because he's emphasizing here. Faith, hope and love and you all go amen. That would be the sort of thing. So clearly this is something they know in the early church. But he's saying, and then he adds the caveat, but the greatest of these is love. Great preaching on them, but love is the greatest of all. And actually, funny enough, these things will last forever. These three things will last forever in a way. Faith will last forever because the faith you have now, you will know was not in vain at the end of time. 
So your faith now will carry you through to the end of time and keep you going. Your hope in Jesus Christ will last forever when you are in eternal life. Do you understand the thing? But he's saying, great, but the greatest of all these, the thing that caveats it all, the things that overpowers it all is love. Love will never cease because God is love. That is eternal. Notice it's eternal. Gifts will stop. Will stop. They won't stop until Jesus comes. But love is now and for ever. And at the end of this little bit, until we then get into chapter 14, which in, if you see in verse 1, it says, let love be your highest goal. That's his argument, which is clearly evident. He's saying to the Corinthians, everything else is futile. If love is the only thing that lasts forever, everything else is futile. Chasing after every gift in the way that you are, in this jealousy, in this rivalry, in this competition, is a complete waste of time. Love is primary. Love of the other person. Every gift, every church meeting, every encounter with others is futile in the great and eternal presence of love. If that is not manifest in the other person, then the encounter of meeting the other person is useless and the use of the gift is hollow. We are called to love each other, my brothers and sisters. All of us are to love each other. May not be each other's bested, closest friend. May not like some people, but you are called to love them. There is a difference. It's a shame for me that Paul had to talk about so much what love is not. When he talks about what love is, we could go further and wider on that. Love is God. We can draw on that daily. Amen? Let's pray. Just give you a moment just to think about yourself. Sometimes we can very much walk away with this with a sense of conviction from God about some of our attitudes and where we haven't shown love. But I also want us to do the flip side. I also want us to ask God, well, show me where I can show love. Where I can be love to somebody else. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We thank you because it is really the absolute essence of you within one reason and how you expect us to be as well. Lord, I pray for all of us as we walk out of here today, Lord, that we will exemplify love, not just to each other, but also to our enemies. to our neighbours. Help us to be lovers of people as well as lovers of you. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.